back to episode three of Illuminating Intersectionality brought to you by Target's Black Beyond Measure initiative, an initiative that uh, highlights black creators and founders stories, uplifts and highlights joy for us and also allows you to buy black all year round. I'm your host, Chef Jade, and I'm here with Fran of Hey Fran Hey and Dr. Takia, co-host alongside myself of the Get and Crone podcast. Today, we're going to talk about intersectionality as it pertains to being a black woman and food, because who doesn't love food? But before we get into that, I want to kick it to Fran and Kia to tell us a little bit more about episode one and two of this three-part series. So in episode one, we started by covering, uh, laying some groundwork, really understanding what intersectionality is as a framework, Mm -hmm. how to use it, how to understand it, and what it really means for us in our really everyday lives. So we talked about the importance of thinking about identity with respect to power and the interlocking systems of racism, sexism, and patriarchy, and couched that uh, conversation in a discussion of how our identities as black girls and black women were shaped in our academic experiences. So what we learned in schools and classrooms about what it means to be a black girl or a black woman, what's socially accepted, what's not, what's expected of us, Mm -hmm. and all of those sort of tensions that come um, in those spaces. So it was a good, it was a good talk. And um, I'm loving the intersection of this outfit, Dr. Takia. Hello, you. you're giving it to me. Get you somebody that can do both. Okay, that's okay. right. <laughs> Fran, you mind recapping episode two for us, please? Of course. So in episode two, we discussed the um, intersection of race and class. And we had a great conversation on socioeconomic advancement, mm-hmm. whether we think it's a myth, whether we see the systems. And it was great because we shared our experiences when our consciousness kind of came online and Mm -hmm. we started gaining awareness of the system itself, um, how we have been participating in the systems, whether conscious or unconscious, and also the things that we're devising, the plans that we're creating on a local level with our communities um, and the ways that we are trying to show up in the world differently, you know, based on how we feel, our intuition, um, and things for the collective as opposed to the individualistic (laughs) system that our society would make you feel is the right way to go about business. And not saying that you shouldn't be an entrepreneur or that you should or shouldn't, but more so how do you move in a way that is best for the collective so that we can all get there together. So you all see that this is <laughs> extremely important, the, the order even of how we're doing this conversation. Mm-hmm. You had to define it, which I think is so important for people who don't even understand what intersectionality is. And you tie right on and, and gave me that nice little alley-oop mm-hmm. right into mine. But before we, you know, I want to get into the fun side of food first. Because mm-hmm. food is such a cultural expression uh, for all of us across the diaspora, across the world, but across the diaspora specifically, because mm-hmm. that's what we're talking about today. So <laughs> uh, with food, I wanted to ask you all, what are some cultural experiences, some dishes, some some memories you have being in the kitchen or just anything that you have as it pertains to food? My grandma kicking me out. (laughs) Get out my kitchen. That is so common. I didn't have the grandma that was like, come, let me teach you. She was like, get out, you're in my way. (laughs) That's a cultural expression. It is, you know? (laughs) Duality is a thing. It is. It's territorial. Kitchen was her domicile. Right, exactly. And "And that's why I don't cook. (laughs) And that's why I order from Grubhub. I love that. But what did you grow up eating? What did you like? What were some of the dishes you can remember eating? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, So it was a mixture because I have Haitian food, Dominican food, uh, Puerto Rican food. I was like, where else am I from? Um, (laughs) Obviously, lots of beans, Mm -hmm. (laughs) lots of white rice, um, Mm -hmm. bernil, Mm -hmm. you know, ropa vieja, like just a lot of different meat dishes and proper pernil where you crack the top of the skin. Like it's got, you got to hear it when you tap it. Of course. And then with the rice, which I know some people think is gross, but we do con con where Mm -hmm. it's like, burnt at mm-hmm. the bottom a little bit and no. that's like the good part that's the, <laughs> what you what you mean there are people that think that that's an improper way to make rice and don't well, understand the cultural value we're of not the crunch. talking to y'all today <laughs> <The crunch. laughs> 
crunch makes it. That so crunch, crunch at the bottom. You get you a good paella and you have the good crunch at the bottom. That's where the flavor lives, baby. Thank you for affirming me. Of course. <laughs> Kia, what do you remember growing up with food? Because we talk about food a lot. We do. We talk um, about food a lot. Food is, is, a, is really one of those uh, central sort of home bases in my mm-hmm. family. Yeah. All of, a lot of my, my memories are tied to meals. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had, um, my family is, is from the South. My mother was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, uh, my dad uh, is from South Carolina. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, you know, lots of Southern sort of tra- traditional conventional dishes, mm-hmm. lots of, you know, fried things. And, you know, I love a greens, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm much more into the veggies. You know, yeah. I love a good pot of greens mm-hmm. and some cabbage or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Get me excited, yeah. you know, some mac and cheese. Yes. We don't stuffing in my family. No, we, we dressing. dressing. Yeah, okay. it's a good <laughs> distinction. Yeah. There's a difference. Very important distinction. Pe- I think people made. in like Rhode Island stuffing. I don't know anything I don't know about, about that. What they do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no shade. But I don't know anything. I'm just saying I don't know anything about. It. Lots of rice and gravy. Mm-hmm. You know, gravy is a comfort. There's comfort. There's solace and. Peace and Sister. peace of mind and some gravy. <laughs> Just yeah. a good flour based Everything you need is in, the gravy. in the gravy. It's in the gravy. It's Y'all in the gravy. So Rice and you know gravy. What's, what's so beautiful about that is that our dishes cross so many different cultures, For right? Sure. So we got black American gravy. Rice you've and got, gravy. You've got uh, jollof rice, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you've got all the jollof wars <laughs> of all the different countries. Lord have mercy. But you got jollof rice, but then you have jambalaya, both mm-hmm. tomato-based rice dishes that span across the diaspora. Mm-hmm. You got um, okra soup. Which and I then you've love. got gumbo. I love, I love okra. I like I fried okra. okra. I also love a stewed. Mm, I love a stew with some tomatoes and, and onions. Oh, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, tomato yes, tomatoes and, and, mm. and corn. Put a little corn in there. When I was pregnant Shut and we didn't mouth. have any money, do you know how much I ate stewed okra, tomatoes, <laughs> and onions with a little sausage over rice? And I love when the okra is mucusy. Yes. I know, like, yes. people, I know, some people you know, that's are weird that. like that. I love it, though. Some people have texture issues. I do not. The snottier, the better. And that's how you... That was the original way for us to thicken soups and yes. gumbos and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then you've got okra soup that comes from the continent and it just crosses across the diaspora. And that's how beautiful and how, how unifying food can be. For yeah. sure. Even in the wars. That's how that's how it is. So yeah. I want to read you all a quote, if you mm-hmm. don't mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. Food, racism, power, and justice are linked. What I'm trying to do is dismantle culinary nutritional imperialism and gastronomic white supremacy with one cup of zobo made from hibiscus, one bowl of Malay salad with ground nuts and dark green vegetables, and one piece of injera at a time. The next wave of human rights abuse is in the form of nutrition and justice. And that's from Michael Twitty, who's a culinary historian and author of The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African American Culinary History in the South. Mm one of my favorites. <laughs> but that quote itself speaks to a larger issue that we have within our community with food apartheid. Mm. And food apartheid is is the proper term, right? Because mm-hmm. we've always known them to be what? Food, food deserts. deserts. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a that's the reframing that we have to do within conversation because food deserts speaks to the fact that this was just just so happened to be. It's happenstance. Yeah. And that it was just a, a product of the environment. It's Whereas insulting. It's yeah. insulting yeah. because food apartheid shows us that the government itself put systems in place to make sure that we as a community are not where we need to be. Yeah. And don't want to give us the proper resources. How many fast food restaurants can you all remember growing up just in your neighborhood alone? I don't think we had anything... But. Outside of fast food yeah. mm-hmm. restaurants, but. yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially in Harlem, you know, Lennox Avenue. Crown, Kennedy, yeah. McDonald's, Burger King. I mean, King. now that it's gentrified, of course, you have your outside eateries. Yeah. And Just de- salad. And delicatessens. <laughs> <laughs> Sad words. You know things are changing when you get delicatessen. It's no more, no more bodegas you at know? all. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, honestly, I can't think of... Not while I was growing up, no. Mm. And what about you, Kia? Same. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the same. And I grew up uh, in the suburbs, so just outside of New York City. Mm. And um, my family, uh, we lived in a parsonage. Uh, my grandfather was a pastor. And so in that particular neighborhood, you know, it was probably on the less diverse side of that of the particular city. Mm-hmm. Um, but the church itself was in... The hood in our community, mm-hmm. and so you can literally see the difference between. And the house it was maybe 
less than a mile away from the church. But, you know, the further you got from the house, the more you got into, you know, the, the supermarkets became bodegas and, you know, there was the delis became corner stores and, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it, it you, you, you literally could see the difference. Um, and it was to, you know, we just grew up thinking that it was the way that it, that it was supposed to be. That's just the way it, it was. Mm-hmm. But now we're able to see that it was a bit more uh, strategic than that. Absolutely. Yeah, and how comfortable we got with just being like, oh, at least for me and in the, in our the way it was split. We always joke like, you know, 96th Street. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the that's day, the line of that's, the border, day. Baby. that's the border. <laughs> you know, it was getting off on 96th Street. And it was staying. And sure. it was the same mm-hmm. for groceries. My mom and I would get on the train when Trader Joe's opened up on mm-hmm. 72nd mm-hmm. and we literally have to commute right. because that's where the good produce was. Right. You know, that didn't smell like ammonia and rat right. droppings oh, and Lord. those scents that segue. we are familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> cat. Cat. Yeah. <laughs> feel like home. Okay. <laughs> Yeasty old sweet bread. <laughs> and like, why the faintest s- scent of mistoline. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, there's a little scent of lavender. Or is that the mansa? That's the apple? I don't know which one but it's there but there's also a faint hint of cat so i'm glad y'all brought that up actually because i was going to ask you about the supermarkets around the way yeah. growing up as well so you spoke to the smells why do our supermarkets smell like that why can not tell you <laughs> why and there was not a supermarket within walking distance um you know and you know my church was really not far from the housing authority complex mm-hmm. as we talked about last yeah, I was waving mm-hmm. yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it wasn't far from there and you know there was no supermarket within walking distance that had you know produce mm-hmm. and you know meat the supermarket where we went to you had to drive to get there so if you didn't have a car. Well, you'd have to drive. You, you wasn't walking this, so you can get to catch the bus. But I'm saying yeah, but it wasn't in proximity. Right on a bus. bus on the think train. about us, and we're not even. And we've we, been there. Right. We, so we remember those days, and I, I grinded days in our early twenties in the cities with our old lady grocery carts. Fingers, fingers <laughs> be like this. Little white marks, you arms know, be cut out. Little red fat pockets on your head. <laughs> you got 19 bags. <laughs> 19 bags on both arms. Like I'm not Oof. got Man. to make it. On <laughs> so. That's important, and I and I, you know, I do traveling dinner parties. Mm-hmm. I remember I went to a dinner party in Philly, and I was sourcing because I like to source within the community. I hold the dinner party in the community. That's what we do. And I go, and I'm like, okay, we're gonna do me and my partner. We're gonna do jerk chicken and uh, with a nice guava sauce, and we're gonna make sure we have a crispy platano. We go in the store, and it is a wall of old bananas, old ripening, rotting bananas with a two two for for one dollar sign as platano. Wow. That they were trying to pass off to a neighborhood that is probably not as familiar with platano as no flatbush. Right, right. But it was just the the gall and the audacity that yeah. that's what they were doing and saying this is good for you all to eat and I knew the minute that I st- everybody know what bad banana smell like mm-hmm. y'all know what it's like when you have ripening bananas mm-hmm. in your house mm-hmm. and you walk in it's awful <laughs> and yeah. so imagine that in a supermarket and this is what you're trying to give to the neighborhood this is what you're trying to give to the community and then with these lack of resources all this fast food all of these things, what do you all think that's doing to our bodies as little black girls as we're developing? Hmm. What was your experience? Because you got some experiences growing up. Well, well, well. <laughs> what was that? Tell me a little bit about that, Kia, because we talked about it. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's just, there's a lot uh, that we could talk about as it relates to sort of, you know, little girls and our bodies and the way that they develop mm-hmm. um, and the hypersexualization that mm-hmm. happens um, to, you know, shapely black girls who are just living in the bodies that they that we have. were born in right um but there are certain you know it it is it is pe- people make assumptions people sort of there are certain labels and sort of things that people assume that you do because mm-hmm. you have hips and a butt um and you know so all all of that comes comes together and if you really think about it uh, the foods that we ingest in our bodies, the preservatives, the uh, hormones, the hormones, the all of that. Exactly. You know, and it, what and are the long term <clears throat> effects of that? For sure. Mm-hmm. Thinking about, and I know that there's been studies done around how those things factor into when girls start their cycles right. or, you know. When you develop breasts. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all, all of those things sort of matter. But even thinking back to what we were talking about on episode one, being cognizant of, you know, identity. 
Um, but also, we have to remain conscious that these things are a function of the systems that we are in. And so it is, we, we can't lose sight of it. It's not by chance. Mm -hmm. And it, it, may, it may not be, it may not appear to seem like someone is strategically thinking, oh, we're only going to limit these resources for these areas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is something happening um, that seems more intentional than not as Absolutely. it relates to access. Absolutely. Access to adequate, um, healthy, nutritious food. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, I think the, what makes it feel like a pressure cooker too, um, even yes, you know, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday <laughs> on episode two, <laughs> when we were just, when I was discussing about, you know, NYCHA and mm -hmm. housing, like it, my, when my mom applied to be in NYCHA, I was born. Like right. she, that was her way of being like, oh, I have my child now, mm -hmm. you know, I need my own place. And we didn't get the apartment, so I turned nine. Wow. Like, nice. that's how long the wait list was. Yep. And imagine you're already stressed with where you're going to live. Mm -hmm. Then you finally get there. You have nothing healthy to eat. Like, it's just such a pressure cooker. Sure. And it's interesting because people will talk about the hood all day, but it's based on white flight outside mm -hmm. of the redlining, yes. you know, and, like, strategic placing. Mm -hmm. But it's like we're just corralled like cattle based on, like, where the white people want to live or mm -hmm. not live. And then they come back, like mm -hmm. we're witnessing now. That's the war, honey. <laughs> and then everything's just changing and, like, like yep. we just keep, because then you, you wonder, well, where do we go now? Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. just that constant push and pull is just like, imagine growing up in that from right. like lack of safety right. in mm -hmm. every realm. It's the just, disposability. It's yes. Absolutely. And it's That's like, a they don't. Beautifully placed word. Don't, the failure to acknowledge our humanity. Right. It's just moving us around like pieces. Like you said, like cattle. Like cattle. Shifting like, us back and forth. Think mm -hmm. about it. You got pockets of time where, every, you know, they were like, I, I want to live closer to the city. The mm -hmm. commute's going to be easier for me. I'm going to bring my family in here. We're going to buy a brownstone. And then later on, oh, you know what? We need some ease. So we're going to go a little further out. We want some land. <laughs> right. It's time for you all to get in here. And in the meantime, we are just pull, pushed and pulled and put wherever we're placed. It's like yeah. capitalism as the herder, mm -hmm. yep. you know, based on people's uh, yep. dynamics and right. where they want to live right. and where business is. It's right. just, yeah, it's tough. And now with gentrification... We, we have our food apartheid, our areas that have food apartheid. But like you said, we got salad spots coming in. I used to have to go down to the meat palace, cut me up a whole chicken. It smells like awful in there. Like, God, it's terrible. Jesus. But now we got the green gourmet or whatever it is next Boy, to it. I'm going to get me a nice little too? sausalito turkey sandwich. When people will say like, you ever see people be like, well, what's wrong with that? This is a great thing. The neighborhood is getting better. Mm. And don't realize what you're saying when mm -hmm. you say that to someone who's a native, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. na if you can call us a native, mm -hmm. but <laughs> right, right. who's a native, you know, that you're telling me now that white people are here, it's getting better. <laughs> Now, now there's good food. It's like, okay, but are you not seeing? Do you not see the problem how, here? Right. Do you the not now? see the setup? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. the bold underlined and italicized now. Like, y'all don't <laughs> see that? Now there's good options. Yeah. Well, it should have been. I yeah. wonder why. I'm raising yeah. babies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dara Cooper, who is a food act activist, co founder, and former executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, identifies food apartheid as three things. The systematic destruction of black self-determination to control our food, including land resource theft and discrimination, a hypersaturation of destructive foods and predatory marketing, so that saturation of fast food that we talked about, and a blatantly discriminatory corporate controlled food system that results in our communities suffering from some of the highest rates of heart disease and diabetes. Why do we have uh, an excess of dialysis clinics only in our neighborhoods? I've never seen one on the Upper East Side. Never, never. <laughs> so, you know, these are some of the ways that food apartheid affects us as a community. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's important for us to have these conversations. But Denise Woodard, who is founder and CEO of Partake Foods, is here to talk to us a little bit more about her initiative and how she started her brand uh, for a very special reason. So I want to hear a little bit more about what she has to say. Me too. Let's check it out. Hi, I'm Denise Woodard. I'm the founder and CEO of Partake Foods. 
When I grew up, I grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina. My dad is black and my mom is Korean. My mom's side of the family all lived in Korea. And so I got her wonderful Korean dishes just about every day of the week. But when I think about holidays and celebrations, it was with my Southern black side of the family. And so I think of comfort foods like fried chicken and macaroni and cheese and all kinds of yummy goodness. And then when I think about my relationship with food, it's evolved as I've had my daughter who has several food allergies and like, how do I bring that same joy and warmth and togetherness that I felt when I brought people together around food for her to experience even with her food allergies. When I grew up in Fayetteville, the supermarket that we frequented was Food Lion. Um, and then we would go to, we would drive like an hour away to this little Korean grocery store. It was probably five aisles big, but it had everything that my mom needed to create magic. Partake Foods was born, the idea was born in the summer of 2016 when my then one-year-old daughter Vivian was diagnosed with allergies to eggs, corn, tree nuts, and bananas. And I was so frustrated and so disappointed with the things I could and couldn't find for her from a taste perspective, from a nutritional perspective. And most of all, I thought about the emotional impact that having food allergies would have. Every birthday party, every play date, every holiday that she wouldn't be able to confidently participate in because of her food allergies. And I wanted to create a brand that I could be proud of that people with food allergies and without food allergies could enjoy. When I started Partake Foods, the mission was all around the idea of being able to partake, particularly for those with food allergies and dietary restrictions. I didn't want them to feel any limits because of the dietary restrictions or food allergies. I wanted them to be able to enjoy worry-free, delicious snacks. So when I first had the idea for Partake, it was actually me and our nanny Martha who has some equity in the business and we went to Whole Foods and we got back in my kitchen and we failed miserably. And then I realized why all the gluten-free things that I could find in the store was full of xanthan gum and sugar and starch and all these ingredients I didn't feel great about giving my daughter. And we tried and we tried hundreds of times. And honestly, we brought in the help of a professional at some point who was able to stay true to the mission that I wanted to see and create a product that I could be proud of that we could also enjoy. I dragged my husband to a big natural foods trade show in March of 2017 when I had Ziploc bag samples of cookies and I said if you see anybody from Target, I don't care where they are, pull them to the side. I didn't really mean the bathroom line, but that is where he found the head of supplier diversity for Target and that is where the relationship began. Um, Target has been a phenomenal partner to us, and then it was through that relationship in the February of 2018 we were able to attend their Black-owned business fair. When I started Partake, the name Partake came from the idea of people with food allergies and dietary restrictions being able to partake. But as a woman, as a person of color, as a first-time founder, I've seen how many other groups have been marginalized and under-resourced and also need the opportunity to partake in all the great things that life has to offer. And so our brand is all about radical inclusivity. How do we make foods that nearly everyone can enjoy safely? And then how do we lift up communities that have not had the access and resources that they need? We particularly lean in on increasing diversity in the food space through an HBCU fellowship program we started three years ago and this year we'll donate a million meals to food insecure kids around America. I want black and brown students to have access to understanding how the food industry works, to the mentorship, to the resources, to the advocates that they need to be able to succeed in the food industry, whether that's to grow a career as an executive, whether that's to start your own company, whether that's to start a restaurant or a food business. I want students to have an open door and the access that they need to be successful. Um, I don't think that the lack of diversity that we see in the food industry is because of a lack of ideas or good products, I think it's all about access. And through the Black Futures and Food and Beverage Fellowship Program, we aim to give more black and brown people access to the food industry in a meaningful way. When I thought about the development of our products, it was really important to me that we went back to the classics. Classic chocolate chip cookies, fudgy brownies, 
things that people with food allergies often have to miss out on that people like me without food allergies take for granted. And I wanted to create products that didn't taste just good for allergy friendly or good for people who are vegan. I wanted products that tasted good so that everyone could come together and enjoy them. So when I grew up, um, there was a fancy grocery store that was about 30 or 40 minutes away and we would drive there occasionally on special occasions to grab things to make special meals. Um, what we often did as well was we would go to local farms and we would go pick berries and we would go pick vegetables and so we had like a real farm to table experience in that way as well. So when I think about driving 30 or 40 minutes to the good grocery store to get the good stuff, I don't want people to have that experience with Partake. It's really important to me that we're making products that are accessible and that we can be found in every community where our consumers want to find our product, where our consumers need our product. And it's also how we think about some of our efforts around food insecurity. As a premium price product, it's also important to me that we're giving back monetarily and product wise to communities that need and deserve our products. When I started Partake, I was coming from a decade-long career in corporate America and I set out to help people with food allergies and I thought about how big of a business that we could build. What I took for granted was how much making a positive impact on the world and being a good example for my daughter would impact me. And when I think about how I want to grow this business, that's what I think about how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna treat people, how we're gonna treat our partners, how we're gonna give back and what legacy this company will leave. Isn't Denise awesome? Isn't so good. Dope? I love, I love what she's done with her partake cookies, and I've crumbled it up and put it on a little sundae before, and it's Ooh. quite delicious. <laughs> Has nothing Thanks to do with this episode. Tip. You're so welcome. That one was for free. I know, you're, and she's got multiple flavors. Yeah. One of the four core tenets that I learned from Dr. Takia of intersectionality Come on. is promoting social justice and social change, mm -hmm. which ties right into how we like to round things out on a positive mm -hmm. note. And so two uh, organizations that I found that I'm really, really excited about what they're doing, both New York City based, mm -hmm. one in the city and one in the South Bronx, mm -hmm. is the Black Urban Grower Society. Bugs. <laughs> and they build networks bugs. and community support. <laughs> bugs. Isn't that cute? <laughs> bugs. Um, and they support communities and growers in urban and rural environments. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's based right here where we're at. And then you've got the Green Worker Cooperatives who build, grow, and sustain worker-owned green companies mm -hmm. in the South Bronx and throughout New York. And it is all owned by their own workers and run by their own workers. And these are ways that we can promote social change within our environment as it pertains to food and mm -hmm. agriculture. Do you, what about, what you what you know about this, Dr. Takia? No, I just love, I was, as you were describing these organizations, one of the things that I love about being a black woman is our capacity to make a way out of no way. Mm. You know, despite the conditions that we find ourselves in, when we don't have the means, we make the means. Mm -hmm. So back when we were talking earlier in the episode about the food that we grew up on, yep. um, you know, coming from humble beginnings, not really having a lot of money, mm -hmm. but we always had food and mm -hmm. food sort of being that home base. Um, even when you didn't think you were going to get a gift, you knew you were going to get a good meal. You knew you were going to get a meal, <laughs> right? You knew you were get a and, meal. and that meal was enough. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. what I love about this, and it really sort of features um, our, our innate gift and capacity. We know how to take what we got and make it what we need. Absolutely. And I love that even despite the systemic barriers um, and limitations that we have that, that you know, you know, have, have cut off our access mm -hmm. to produce, we, these organizations are teaching families how to create their own gardens, even in the city where folks will be like, you know, y'all got grass and Soil? The it's dumbest like, question ever. Yes, I hate it every we time. We absolutely do. Trees too. Yes. <laughs> many. I mean I mean so many. Mm -hmm. But you know, I I love I love that. And I think that that is one of the things that uh is, can be seen throughout the history of black women, black women feminists. It's been sort of our 
mainstay, yes. you know, our capacity to take what we got and make it make it what we need it to be, Absolutely. even despite the circumstances. But that does not uh, sort of preempt us from calling out that the systems, in fact, need to change. They need to be yes. changed. Yeah. We have some, so we have some discussion prompts that we have at the end of every single episode, one, two, and three, now three, okay? <laughs> Make sure you watch all three of them. <laughs> and these are ways that we can continue these conversations because it's so important that we continue these conversations and mm-hmm. talk about it. And like we said in the beginning, how unifying is food. Everybody's got to eat. It don't matter who you are or what you do, everybody's got to eat, and we all deserve healthy and nutritional options. So... I just want to have this little conversation with you all. Good. and good. I talk about food any day. I know you will, Taurus <laughs> Queen. <laughs> Thank you to Target and their Black Beyond Measure initiative so that we are able to have these types of conversations. Make sure you all check out those discussion prompts and check out all three episodes of Illuminating Intersectionality. I'm your host this episode, Chef Jade. I'm here with Fran and Dr. Kia, and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>